The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to Mark chapter 4. Gospel of Mark chapter 4. We're reading verses 35 through 41. Though I regret to say I don't have pyrotechnics or rain sticks. That was great, by the way. Um, Something's going to fall on me? Oh, thank you. You all couldn't see, but Marilyn just avoided catastrophe. (laughs) I blame Pat. (laughs) That close. Mark chapter 4, beginning with verse 35, reading through verse 41. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up, imagine that, and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, help us to hear what you would have us to hear, Lord, that we may do what you call us to do, so that we may be the people you call us to be. In your holy name we pray, amen. I have to tell her, he said, I have to tell her my true feelings. That's what he said to me. I suppose teenage infatuation makes poets out of even the most unlikely folks, even some redneck boy in South Alabama. He had been wrestling with these feelings for days, and I'm sure for him it probably felt like months. He had to tell her. He had to tell her how he felt, how he thought about her often, how he wanted to ask her out, but he was afraid that she'd say no because they went to do different high schools and she was a year or two younger than him. But my friend was telling me all about how much he liked this girl, maybe hoping that I'd give him some rousing pep talk that would propel him from the passenger seat of my pickup and over into this small crowd of girls gathered in the parking lot. It's funny now, as an adult, but back then... When you're a teenager, it seems like those sorts of things make and break your whole life. Like relationships are more than necessary. Back then when we were teenagers, it seemed like life wouldn't go on without someone to take to a movie every once in a while. Someone to spoil when the cheddar biscuits come around at Red Lobster go, don't worry baby, I got those, right? (laughs) Somebody to take to the salad bar at Ruby Tuesday, or what eventually won my love over. Two Dairy Queen chicken finger sandwiches, a Diet Mountain Dew, and an orange Fanta. That was true, by the way. She's not in here, but that was our first date. I mean, it just got more expensive from there. Um, (laughs) But he sat there until he just couldn't stand it anymore. Then he opened the door of my truck. He got out. He walked across the parking lot, and he spilled his guts. He told this girl his true feelings, and I watched as his shoulders fell The bib of his cap went down, and he slinked back over to my truck. He climbed in. He shut the door, looked over at me and said, let's just go home. He poured his soul out to her, the best he could anyway. He did what takes mountains of courage for most boys that age to do. He did it all in the broad light of a buzzing street lamp in the close proximity of her girlfriends in a parking lot. He took the bold risk that has inspired playwrights, novelists, and poets, and it burned him. It burned him bad. 
Because you see, she didn't respond with some bubbly reaction about, oh, I'm so glad you came over. I've been waiting to tell you. Oh, I'm so happy. No, she didn't do that. It was worse than that. She didn't even tell him how ugly he was. Didn't laugh in his face. Didn't tell him to hit the bricks. Didn't say, I have no interest. No, now I don't like you. Go on somewhere else. She didn't do that. No. It was even worse than that. When my friend poured out his feelings to this girl, the event which had no doubt kept him up at night before that day, that moment perhaps he had imagined with its own soundtrack in the background. When he told this girl his true feelings for her, do you know what she said? She said what may be the most devastating grouping of syllables in our language. He poured his heart out to her, and all she said in response was, I don't care. I don't care. Mm. Man, those words will cut you more than just about anything else will, won't they? I don't care. They'll leave you with an emotional hole and emptiness when they come, especially from someone about whom you care a great deal. Oh, we might say them flippantly. You probably said them already this morning as the choir was coming down. Hey, babe, where do you want to go to lunch? Oh, I don't care. You may say them flippantly. You might be walking out of the Walmart. Hey, let's get a red box. What you want to watch? I don't care. But after you've followed someone, after you've poured yourself out to them, after you've made so many risks just to show them that you care, I don't care. That hurts in a way beyond description. But what hurts even more, what can inflict even greater pain and leave our hearts broken and ground into dust, is when we know someone doesn't care, when we think someone doesn't care without them even having to say it. When we think someone doesn't care because of their complete lack of interest in our lives and our very well-being. Because at least, at least an enemy thinks enough of us to hurt us. At least an enemy thinks enough of us to want to stop us, to inflict pain or grief in our lives. But for someone to just not care, I don't care. Teacher, do you not care? That's what they said. That's what they said when they woke him up. Teacher, do you not care? I mean, when you're in a skinny John boat without so much as a trolling motor, crossing a big lake late at night, the wind whips up a storm, all hell breaks loose, the waves beat into the boat, the boat was already being swamped, the Bible says, and the one who dragged you out there in the middle of it all, in all this chaos, is asleep. On a cushion. Just asleep. Yeah, I could get the feeling he doesn't care. Who does that? Who does that sort of thing? Who takes a nap when waves are crashing all around you? When storms are raging? When even the experts, these fishermen, who've no doubt been out on this lake time after time when a storm has come up, when all these folks are crossing themselves and putting on the little orange life jackets, looking at how deep the water is, and you're asleep, who does that? Who, if he had the power to stop it, would just go right on sleeping through all this chaos? Obviously, somebody who doesn't care, right? Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? I've heard similar words. I've heard similar words come out of my own mouth. Of course, they weren't spoken in the midst of a storm on a lake somewhere off the coast of some village in ancient Judea. No, they were spoken in the darkness towards the ceiling in my bedroom in the car after a long, excruciating day, in my office after hearing another tragedy, after reading another news story. The words themselves were different, but their intent was the same. God, do you not care? God, do you not care that your people are dying? Do you not care that children are starving? God, do you not care that good people are hurting? God, do you not care that we're down here trying our best? God, do you not care? I've said those words. 
I bet you have too. When your best laid plans fall through your fingers like so many grains of sand, when all you've worked for for so long goes up in flames with a single word, a single envelope in the mailbox, when the phone rings and the voice on the other end sends your world careening into a tailspin, I bet you said that once or twice. God, do you not care? Do you not care that we are perishing? Too often it can seem like God's just taking it easy, catnapping on some clouded cushion while the world burns. Too often it can feel like God doesn't care, like God is far off in heaven making sure that the right folks get in and the wrong folks stay out. Maybe maybe that's what God is doing. Maybe that's on God. After all, if God really cared, wouldn't God do something about all this, all this mess? Wouldn't God have intervened before it got this bad, cutting it off at the pass, making sure things never got this out of hand? I mean, couldn't God at least make sure the storms pass before we got in the boat? Couldn't God maybe wait until morning when we can at least see the storms on the horizon? When our confidence to row against the waves may be a little greater. Can't God keep bad things from happening? Evil folks from rising to power? Can't God manipulate our circumstances enough to make sure we don't lose our job? To make sure no child ever goes hungry? To make sure the crops grow, that the nets are filled with fish? That the bank account stays in the black? To make sure we never have to go to war again? Can't God do that? If God really cares about all of us? Why does it feel like God's just asleep somewhere on a cushion? Then again, maybe, maybe that's on us. I mean, things don't just happen without folks making them happen, right? And even when a storm rolls in late at night on the lake, no one had to get in the boat, right? They could have said, ah, well, let's wait till morning. Maybe God seems to not care because so often it seems like we don't care. I mean, how can someone be comfortable enough to fall asleep in the boat in the first place? I can't sleep in a car if the driver is anxious. And yet there's Jesus asleep on the cushion. Maybe when it seems like God doesn't care, it's really just the amplification of our own apathy. A reflection of our own disinterest. I don't know. But I do know there seems to be a growing sense of folks not caring. Especially about others. As if there's a growing attitude that says, who cares if the other boats make it to the shore as long as me and mine get there? Maybe. Maybe that's on us. Maybe it's on God. Really, though, I'm partial to believing that it's all in the way we see things, the way we perceive our circumstances. I mean, think about what's going on in this scene in Scripture. The storm comes, it pounds the boat. These disciples, these professional fishermen are scared to death. And in their fear, they say, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And you know how I hear that? They're walking over, shaking him by the shoulders. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? It's like they believe that they're all going to die. But Jesus is just going to go right on sleeping. But there's a very important lesson here. And it's easy to overlook because it's so obvious. It's like the nose on our face. It's just there all the time, but it's so obvious we forget about it. Our brains have wired us to just overlook it. The disciples on the boat don't see it. And I don't think we do either. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with him in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. Did you catch it? Did you hear it? It's so obvious, but it's subtle. They took him with them in the boat. Just as he was. Where's Jesus? In the boat with them. He got right in the boat. In fact, Jesus has probably been standing in that boat at least since verse 1 when he started teaching all these folks in parables. Jesus is in the boat with them. 
Do you get what's happening there? Do you see what's happening? Jesus isn't back on the shore when the storms roll in. He's not even walking on the water. He's not spending the night in some holiday inn when the phone rings and the disciples are hollering in their cell phones, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing out here on this lake while you're chilling out in the bathrobe laying on a cushion? No. He's in the boat with them. He's right there in the midst of the storm. Not above it, not beyond it, not behind it, but right smack dab in the middle of it. With them. And you get the impression they've forgotten about that. Don't we? Don't we forget about that? I mean, we, got, we like the end of this story. Jesus wakes up, rebukes the wind, calms the storm, as if he's exercising some demon. But he doesn't do it from the sidelines. Not from a throne in heaven. Not from the isolated, sterile sanctuary where only the best and brightest, right and righteous reside. He does it right in the midst of the storm, in spite of the storm, in spite of their fear, in spite of all that would otherwise make sense. Jesus speaks peace in the midst of the chaos because that's where Jesus is. Right there, in the middle of it all. Now I know There are times in our lives when it feels like the storm will overtake us. When the wind will overpower us. When we can't take one more bit of bad news. When we can't hear one more tragic story. When we can't take one more hit. When we can't get out of bed in the morning. When we can't answer that call one more time. When we can't make that call one more time. I know. There are times when we want to look up to the heavens and ask, God, Don't you care that I'm dying? Can I tell you something? You might not like it, but I want you to hang with me. Can I tell you something? Don't expect an answer from the sky. Because that's not where God is. God's not there. God's right there in the midst of all that junk with you. Right there in the swirling clouds of thunder and fear. Right there in the raging waters of uncertainty and dread. Right there in the place where the human and the divine meet. In the midst of fear, grief, pain, faith, hope, and love. God's not asleep on a cushion. God's hanging on a cross. Right there, in the midst of it all. In this whole thing, in this whole battered boat with us. And he's going through it with every one of us. May we never forget it. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit. Lord, make us mindful of your presence among us. Lord, not only in times of joy, in those moments when it seems like heaven is all around us. God, remind us that you are here even when it seems like hell is all around us. God, make us mindful of your presence in our hearts and our lives. You are not some far-off God, but one who is very real and very present. And made that presence known to all by your presence on the cross. So, Lord, right now, if we are in a boat being battered by the waves, help us, Lord, to see you here with us. Speak to our hearts. Show us who you are. Even before you calm the wind and the seas. Be with us, Holy Spirit. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.